Peace be upon you. So there's a couple verses in the Quran that many people pull out of context to make it seem as if God's words in the Quran are sexist, that God prefers the men over the women. And this isn't so. And I wanted to look at these verses and shed some light on them. The first one has to do with the time of Moses when Pharaoh inflicted a persecution upon the children of Israel. And it's spelt out in Surah 2, verse 49 and 7, 141, where it reads, Recall that we saved you, in reference to the children of Israel, from Pharaoh's people who inflicted upon you the worst persecution, slaying your sons and sparing your daughters. Now, that was an exacting test from your Lord. And the same account is recalled in Surah 14, verse 6, where it re reads, Recall that Moses said to his people, Remember God's blessings upon you, that he saved you from Pharaoh's people who inflicted the worst persecution upon you slaughtering your sons and sparing your daughters. That was an exacting trial from your Lord. And some people, they read this and they say, you know, how is that the worst persecution? As if it's worse to lose men than uh, women. Uh, as if God is favoring the men over the women. And what they fail to recognize is what happens to a society where the ruling power kills all the men and leaves only the women. How do you think those women are treated in that society? Do you think that they're able to fend for themselves? Do you think that they have much rights in a society like that? When you eliminate the bread earners, the warriors of that society, what do you expect happens to the women who have to grow up in such a society? This is the reason it's considered the worst persecution. Your only lifeline of fighting back has been eliminated. Your future generations have suffered. Your future army is non-existent. This is what makes this so terrible. I bet there was parents who would wish that their children didn't have to live in such a society, that their women were not born into such atrocities. But this is the way it is. And it's fascinating. If you look what happens in a society where it's predominantly female, and this isn't even in a society that is uh, oppressive per se, but looking at U.S. college campuses, when the majority of the students are females, do you think that sexual assault goes up or down? You would think that it would go down as if there's more females to uh, stick together to help out one another. But surprisingly, sexual assault goes up. It's because women are looked at as a commodity. So the few who end up even living in that society during the time of this persecution among the children of Israel are more apt to treat the women as a commodity because they are the scarce resource. So not only would they be persecuted by the Egyptians, they would probably be disrespected by their own people just because of the circumstances. So this is the reason that it's the worst persecution. In Surah 3 verse 195, we read that their Lord responded to them, I never fail to reward any worker among you for any work you do. Be you male or female, you're equal to one another. God is telling us, as far as belief is concerned, as far as his interests are concerned, the only thing that distinguishes us is our righteousness. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female. We each have an equal opportunity to gain in righteousness. In Surah 4, verse 32, it says, You shall not covet the qualities bestowed upon each other by God. The men enjoy certain qualities and the women enjoy certain qualities. You may implore God to shower you with his grace. God is fully aware of all things. So each of us, male or female, we have certain qualities that God has bestowed upon us. Women enjoy certain qualities and the men enjoy certain qualities. And we shouldn't covet the qualities that God has given to either party. In 434, it says the men are made responsible for the women. And God has endowed them with certain qualities and made them the bread earners. This is a responsibility upon the men. And with every single responsibility, uh, every single privilege comes responsibility. The fact that the men are made into warriors, that the men are expected to be the bread earners, that means they have the responsibility of taking care of the women. This is a responsibility that both parties should readily accept and be cheerful of. One of these responsibilities for men is that they have to be warriors when called to account. That if they have to go to battle, it's not the women, it's not the children that are going to fight. It has to be the men. In 475, it reads, Why should you not fight in the cause of God when weak men, women, and children are imploring? Our Lord, deliver us from this community whose people are oppressive, and be you our Lord and Master. This is a responsibility upon the men, that when in a society, if you have to go to war, the men are the ones who have to risk their lives 
to fend for, uh, to fight off oppression, to fight uh, for liberty, for justice. This is the men's responsibility. In 498, it reads, Exempted are the weak men, women, and children who do not possess the strength nor the means to find a way out. Meaning that this responsibility falls upon the strong men, the grown men, the people who can fight for themselves, who can stand up for others. This is a quality and a responsibility that every single adult male has to bear. In Surah 2 verse 246, it reads, Have you noted the leaders of Israel after Moses? They said to their prophet, If you appoint a king to lead us, we will fight in the cause of God. He said, Is it your intention that if fighting is decreed for you, you will not fight? They said, Why should we not fight in the cause of God when we have been deprived of our homes and our children? Yet when fighting was decreed for them, they turned away, except a few. God is aware of the transgressors. This is the responsibility of men. The men are made responsible for the women. They've been bestowed with certain qualities. And their responsibility is the fact that if their freedom, their liberty is being threatened, it's the men's responsibility to do something about it. So at the time of the children of Israel, during Moses, entire generation of men have been wiped out. Any chance of defending their liberties to fight oppression has been eliminated. And this is a duty that in the cause of God, we are allowed to stand up and fight against oppression, to fight for liberty, for freedom of religion, for freedom of speech. In Surah 2 verse 190 through 193, it reads, You may fight in the cause of God against those who attack you, but do not aggress. God does not love the aggressors. You may kill those who wage war against you, and you may evict them once they evicted you. Oppression is worse than murder. Do not fight at the sacred masjid unless they attack you therein. If they attack you, you may kill them. This is the just retribution for those disbelievers. If they refrain, then God is forgiver, most merciful. You may also fight to eliminate oppression and to worship God freely. If they refrain, you shall not aggress. Aggression is permitted only against the aggressors. So these are the guidelines of war. Is that yes, the Quran talks about war. Yes, the Quran talks about killing. But it can only be done in the act of self-defense. And it can only be done to fight oppression. God does not like the aggressors. Meaning if someone is not aggressing against us, we have no reason but to offer them peace. And there's a quote I love. It says, the society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. And in the Quran, this is what it comes down to, is that it's the responsibility of the men to not cower away from such actions. That if it comes to it, if they have to go to war, that they do this willfully just like the women, except that the men are made responsible for them and accept that willfully. Another example that's oftentimes cited to try to make it seem as if God's words are sexist is in reference to the angels as females. In Surah 43 verse 16 it reads, Has he chosen from among his creations daughters for himself while blessing you with sons? When one of them is given news of a daughter as they claim for the most gracious, his face is darkened with misery and anger. They say, what is good about an offspring that is brought up to be beautiful and cannot help in war? They claim that the angels who are servants of the most gracious are females. Have they witnessed their creation? Their claims are recorded. They will be asked. So in this reference, the problem isn't the fact that they're just calling the angels female. It's a fact that they're insinuating two things. One is that the angels are the daughters of God. This in itself is a blasphemy. God has never beget, nor was he begotten. Additionally, what they're doing is they're ascribing to God what they don't want for themselves. These are people who are willing to bury an innocent girl in the dust because they prefer the boys over the girls. And despite that, they're attributing females to God what they don't like for themselves. But God gets equally, if not more, um, upset at the accusation that he has a son. In 1990, it says, the heavens are about to shatter, the earth is about to tear asunder, and the mountains are about to crumble because they claim that the most gracious has begotten a son. It is not befitting the most gracious that he should beget a son. Every single one in the heavens and the earth is a servant of the most gracious. 
And in 1935, it reads, It does not befit God that he begets a son. Be he glorified. To have anything done, he simply says to it, Be, and it is. This attribute of begetting, what does it mean? This is a human attribute. This is the way that humans procreate. This is not befitting to be attributed to God. God is the creator. In order for God to create something, he simply says to it, Be, and it is. In Surah 112, it's uh, entitled The Absoluteness. It reads, In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, proclaim, He is the one and only God, the absolute God. Never did He beget, nor was He begotten. None equals Him. Now, some people make the argument that can't God have a son if He wanted to? Couldn't God have a daughter if He wanted to? Sure, it's God. God could do whatever he wants. But God tells us in 4381, proclaim, if the most gracious did have a son, I would still be the foremost worshiper. Meaning God can do whatever he wants, but he's telling us that he has never beget, nor was he begotten, that he doesn't have any uh, daughters, any sons, that he's one and only one. So God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at crontalk at gmail.com. And until next time, peace and God bless.